We have a, just a tremendous community here. I think we're going to have a lot of things in the next 10 years that we're going to do together as industry. We have a lot that's been done the last 10 years and 10 years before then. You know, the first 10 years, you could say, of computers was getting a desktop in every home, in every business. In the last 10 years, we put a thousand songs in people's pockets. In this 10 years, I think we have something a little more interesting, which is the ability to affect people's lives in ways that are very important. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I think that what we do, ironically, at Digital Reasoning, um, I'd like to start with something a little more humorous, which is, um, you know, you come to New York, have a drink later. I'm sure someone's going to ask you this in the first three questions, right? So what do I do for a living? Well, if you're curious... Now, only at Strata would someone say this. So, I'm hoping someone else says this, right? (laughs) Now, it's more than a framework. Uh, My company, Digital Reasoning, um, I founded it about over 12 years ago at 20. So, uh, I've been trying to build the world's oldest startup. And... um, we built this product called Synthesis, just as a little background, uh, that really is going after the machine reading problem. And so essentially people have to read things that are very important at huge scale, and we make sense of that for them. So I didn't really come to talk about what I do though. I came kind of as, you know, based on both the guidance, the conversations people put on the conference to talk about what we should be doing as a community. So I'm gonna go straight into that. And that's essentially, I wanna lead with a thesis, which is that big data story is not about data. Okay? For all we talk about data and engineering, those are means to an end. The big data story is about people understanding data to change and improve their lives. And I'll get into a variety of ways we see that happening today, and I think other ways that we can make this happen in far more powerful ways with the technologies that are available now. So I think that we spend a lot of time on things like this graphic, the big obligatory explosion of data curve, right? There's probably about, you know, 70 to 1,000 slickers here that have some kind of data curve on it, right? Now I want to concentrate on the part that's at the bottom, which is human attention, and that's what's flat. Now the delta between human attention and the data explosion is what I call the understanding gap, okay? Understanding gap is the things that we're supposed to understand, to know, the things we have a responsibility to know, but we can't read. People read at about a half kilobyte to a quarter kilobyte a second of ASCII text, if you actually clock it. And if you captured every human conversation in the world at one time, you're probably dealing with something that's on the order of probably right around a few terabits a second, maybe a tens of terabits a second. So I think a lot of our energy is going to have to be covering this gap. And so big understanding, I think, is where we have to go next. Big understanding is what is now possible after big data. So I want to talk a little bit about how we do that. When I say how we do that, I'm saying how all of us can tackle that. I didn't come here to talk so much about my company with this. Um, but the first thing I think that we need a very big investment in that we've worked on, something that we know a lot about digital reasoning, really is in machine learning. If people don't have time to read things, if they don't have time to review things because the intentional curve is not getting any better, then we have to have the machines read things and learn things. And I'll actually uh, quote someone I have a great deal of respect for who's here at the conference, Ted Dunning. He gave a great talk here in New York a couple of weeks ago. I got a chance to attend about how the organizations in the Web 2.0 world had competitively created massive separation because of the ones that could learn faster. If you have a one plus n function to the k, the faster you learn, it's the k, right? And as you iterate, the gap between you and others it's far bigger if you focus on the K, the speed of learning, than on the incremental inside the parentheses. So I think that what we have to focus on is making all software learned. 
It's actually why I started this company. Was I was frustrated with the fact that as a philosophy student, as an undergrad, writing reports, autocorrect on Word would never get any smarter. And I said, why can't it just figure out that don't delete all my bullets when I backspace? And how many versions are we in version 20 now or something? I still think it has this problem. So, um, so I say this because it's a simple thing where learning has been you know, limited. Uh, bare metal, I'll, I'll kind of cover this briefly. Um, one thing is we proliferate a lot of frameworks, a lot of tools, one on top of the other, like building up on a city that's crumbled and putting another city on top of it, then crumbling in another city. And uh, a friend of mine, John Langford, who uh, was senior in machine learning at Yahoo, just ran over to Microsoft this last year, uh, had a tremendous paper last year where he was able to do sort of the first trillion feature scale online parallel learning system and publish on it. Now, the irony is that sounds very impressive, and it is. It blew the doors off everything that come before. But we have processors now that can handle on the order of 100 billion instructions per second. He was running on 1,000 nodes. So if we do the math, we're somewhere between one to two orders of magnitude off optimal usage still. So these frameworks today, like Impala, other things that have been announced, I'm actually pretty excited that we're going to keep making headway there. But I think we have a long way to go. And it's actually making it leaner. It's not making it thicker. And that's kind of my point. Finally, applications. I think that we have to focus a lot more on the software, on delivering this to people. And I believe, fundamentally, that we focus too much on people giving us their data and not enough on giving them back software they can do with their data. And I think we're going to see that shift. So transition away from the how. So the what is understanding. The how is the means I just went through to, you know, the who, and that's people. And the people are more important than the data. So I'll give a few anecdotes really briefly. Uh, when we got started, we worked uh, closely with Army Intelligence, and we don't go too far into that. Uh, we work with other people in the intelligence community, you know, through InQtel. This is one of our known investors. Um, and I think that this is probably the most important mission in the world. And I'll talk about this a little bit later in terms of missions. But we aren't here today unless this mission succeeds. I mean, we're about five miles north of where a lot of people aren't here anymore. So understand the assumptions of freedom. And I say there's some people here having a booth. Go look for them from U.S. government and other logos hanging around. If you want to serve, if you want to find a way to help, talk to them. These are good people. Uh, I'll talk about another project that we've done. Um, so a few weeks ago, uh, we wrapped up and briefed out the results of an effort with uh, the Demi and Ashton Foundation. And we decided that um, well, we were actually approached, so I'll credit them with the idea. But we basically um, said, well, can't we use machine learning technology on natural language to be able to look at ads in deep, dark recesses of the Internet that might be actually marketing little girls? One of the sad things about a low-friction environment is there's a lot of dark things going on in certain parts of that environment. And a lot of bad guys taking advantage of it. And so we were successful in building a detector for essentially online ads in deep, dark recesses and briefed it out at Twitter a little while ago um, that with a, over 90% precision could tell if an ad is just talking about you know, a sexually explicit thing or it's actually in covert cover terms, using a term from our other industry, pushing little girls out. Um, and so I want to take that, and there's a, there's a person on my staff here, uh, John Waxer, one of our senior scientists who worked on that. Go talk to him. He did some amazing work with that. Um, just I'm so proud of this team. And we did this, you know, pretty much, you know, to get it done. And so one thing I would announce today is our company is dedicated to solving some really morally interesting problems. And if you, on your own time or with a nonprofit, want to go after a problem with us, if you want to use our technology at whatever scale to solve that problem, come talk to us. It's not about business for us on those things. Licensing will not get in the way with that. And I think that we all, with the technology we're building, ought to be giving part of that away for the open source community. Even those of us that are in the proprietary community need to lower those barriers. So 
Uh, a new area that we're in, and, and uh, I'll kind of stop here on this one because uh, Rob Metcalf, my partner, is going to be talking later today at 5 o'clock with Offer Solutions about some of the efforts going on here. But we believe it's morally important to be able to go and guard against major systemic risks in the financial industry, that we all suffer from that, and then the world suffers if we're weaker. So I, I kind of transition here because, uh, and I'm going to quote, you know, uh, uh, Jeff Hammerbacher, that, you know, I think that, the, that what I'm trying to get across is a point he's already made, which is that it is, you know, unfortunate that in our generation, the brightest minds are being used to learn how to cl- get people to click on ads. And my hope is that in this decade, the 2010s, that we have a shift from consumerism back to mission with our technologies. There's just too much talent intelligence here. So three key missions, national security, financial risk, and then I won't go too far into healthcare because precisely because Mike, I think, led with some great stuff there. Um, but I think the greatest breakthroughs, the greatest potential of big data is actually in healthcare because it affects everyone's life in ways that we can barely anticipate now. So big data is a means to an end. And understanding essentially is a great cause with greater consequence. And I chose the word cause very explicitly. Cause means that it's not a could or a can. It's a should. It's a responsibility. We have gifts and we have a responsibility. And being a technologist is not just about getting the freedom to work on cool stuff. Yeah, we get that. But it's about being given the gift to change the world. And a lot of people say that, people market that, whatnot. I I didn't come here to market that. I've come here to challenge. And so to do that, I'll kind of end with three quotes that are some of my favorites. The first is, um, I'm a big Batman fan from the Chris Nolan movies. Um, And this is one of those little lines that could just easily go by, but I thought it was very appropriate, especially here in New York which is the reason I'm saying this stuff here, the reason I'm focusing on you as an audience and the ones attending this conference, is precisely because this only gets fixed from inside the city. It gets fixed from us. It doesn't get fixed by politicians. It doesn't get fixed by waiting for a foundation to step up because they need us. And the time of it is right now because we live in a partnership. We live in a partnership between those that are here in this room, those that are outside in the city, those that are across the world, those that have come before us that are no longer here, and those that are coming. So a thousand songs in your pocket should be a thousand cures by the end of this decade. And it's a choice everyone makes here with their lives. So I, I put that forward, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with one last thing, one of my all-time sort of favorites. You know, you can't get through a geek conference without someone actually putting a Lord of the Rings quote up, right? Um, and this is my favorite one, because at the very end in the, in the books, um, you know, Samwise looks up at Gandalf. He hasn't seen him for, you know, many, many, you know, since the, the first book. And he says, is everything sad going to become untrue? And I think about this, because I think about... Um, the many things that we've had to live with. Um, you know, we're 4,062 days late in this, from my opinion. And um, I think that we need to, to start now and we need to start to make a world. I'm a philosopher, and so fundamentally, uh, a philosopher gets trained in things like possible worlds. And I believe there's a possible world where many things are untrue in the future that could be true if we don't do things. I think there was a possible world, a very likely one, where there was another hit on America, but for a lot of things people did in the last 10 years. If you did a poll three to six months after 9-11, everyone thought that would happen. And it didn't. That was a world that became untrue. I believe that there are people. My mom, is a, it's her birthday today, and um, I'm up here instead of being back home, but uh, she'll give me a pass on that one. Um, but she's a cancer survivor stage three colon cancer five years ago as of May and a decade before she would have been 50-50 or less she had about 75% chance when it was diagnosed and she came through it all so I think that 
there are so many elements. I know I won't ask for a raise of hands or something here, but there are so many of y'all I know that have friends, family, loved ones that are sick, that have, you know, kids that may be sick. Um, and I believe that in this room has an amazing power to change that. And so I would ask that, you know, when we talk about Strata being putting big data to work, I guess I'm saying, let's go to work. Okay? And I appreciate all of you. I don't say that as if y'all aren't doing it. I say it knowing many of you working on amazing things. And it's a privilege to be here. But let's write our mythology, which was, you know, from the PCs to the laptops to the internet, our mythology can be the understanding that changes everybody's lives. Thank you very much.